So now let me go ahead and talk about how we usually measure efficiency and the gains from trade. We really would like to measure economic welfare directly. We would really like to measure people's happiness, or as economists often call it, their utility. But when you start to think about this, there's really all kinds of practical and even theoretical problems with this. If I go ahead and ask you to tell me how happy you are today from 1 to 10, and you answer 5 today, and then tomorrow I survey you again, and I ask you and you say 6, well, 6 is 20% higher than 5. What would that even mean to say that I'm 20% happier today than I was yesterday? It really becomes a very tricky thing out there. And whether we can sort of compare even within a single person in that sort of way is very tricky. So economists generally think even in the best case scenario, we can't really measure happiness as an absolute number. That's what we sort of talk about is the idea of cardinal utility. Instead, rather, we need to just sort of think about measuring what we call ordinal utility, which is looking at the idea of ranking, I'm happier today than I was yesterday, but not trying to tie it down into a specific number. Even bigger problems out there come when you try to engage in what's called interpersonal comparisons, when you try to compare people's happiness. And suppose I say that I am happy at level 8, and you say you're happy at level 5. Well, what does 8 mean for me, and what does 5 mean for you? And any systematic attempt to measure total economic welfare, you would have to do these kind of interpersonal comparisons. And it's really, when you think about it, just kind of crazy to try and do that at least in my particular opinion. So economists tend to look instead at what we call money metric measurements of the gains from trade. We can't really measure your level of happiness, but we might be able to measure how much value something delivers to you. And we're going to go ahead and try and do that using monetary terms. So we've really narrowed down what we're hoping to measure from your overall economic welfare to the benefits that you get from a particular market or a particular transaction. So we measure the two sides of the market using related concepts, but they're both calculated a little bit differently. The first concept is the idea of consumer surplus. And consumer surplus measures the net benefit a consumer gets from participating in a transaction. And the first thing we do is we identify what people's willingness to pay for a good is. What is the maximum price that people are willing and able to pay for a good? And notice this gets us beyond a survey question where people are just kind of going to give any answer that occurs to them. We want to look at people's actual behavior because we know that actions speak louder than words. And the idea would be if the price is low and of course no one likes it when the price goes up and someone might say, you know, I'm not going to buy if the price of gasoline goes up to eight bucks. I'm just going to refuse. But we want to look at how people actually behave. And we want to look at what point do people actually convert from being a buyer of a good to a non-buyer of a good as the price goes up. Or uh, we could go ahead and look, right now something is too pricey for you, but how low would the price have to go before you'd be willing to buy it? And obviously, the lower the price has to go before it triggers your purchase, the less you value the good. So we calculate your overall benefit from a transaction by looking at the maximum amount you're willing to pay and subtract off what you actually did pay. So if there's some pair of jeans and you would be willing to pay up to $25 for them and you actually paid $10 for them, then you're pretty happy with your purchase. So you got sort of $15 worth of psychological benefit on net. On the other hand, if you're willing to pay a maximum of 25 and you actually paid 24 and someone asks you, you know, are you happy with your purchase? You'd probably go, eh, kind of, you know, I'm not sure if it was worth it. 
So you can see where this concept of consumer surplus makes some sense. Willingness to pay is really the fundamental determinant of demand. And really it's best to think about the demand curve being built out of people's willingness to pay. If people have a high willingness to pay, there's going to be a high level of demand. A low willingness to pay is a low level of demand. As a simple illustration of this, let's go ahead and take the example from Mankiw's textbook and think about a situation where we have several potential buyers, each with a different willingness to pay. At a really high price, above 100, the price is above anyone's willingness to pay, so no one's willing to pay it, and quantity demanded is zero. As the price gets down to 100, suddenly John is willing to pay $100, so he's willing to buy, and quantity demanded grows to one. Further price declines don't do anything to quantity until we get to Paul's willingness to pay of 80, and then Paul becomes a willing buyer because the price has reached Paul's willingness to pay. So quantity demanded grows to two, and so on and so forth. And notice that the height of the demand curve at each quantity tells us what that buyer's willingness to pay is. So the height of the demand curve at each quantity tells us the willingness to pay of what's called the incremental or marginal buyer, the last buyer to come into the market. We can use this to measure willingness to pay, sorry, measure consumer surplus when we have nice smooth demand curves. So typically we're going to have smooth demand curves, not this step function, and we are going to look at consumer surplus as the area below the demand curve and above the price. Because again, consumer surplus is willingness to pay minus price. So we're going to take the height of the demand curve and subtract off the price. So for this first unit at a very high price, someone had a very high willingness to pay. And if they only paid P1, they got a really pretty decent sized chunk of consumer surplus. Later buyers have lower willingness to pay, and so if they buy for this price P1, they get less net, less net benefit from participating in the transaction. So you can think about there being a whole bunch of little columns here, and all those little columns add up to this triangle. So how do we actually calculate the area of that triangle? We're going to think about the base and the height of the triangle. The base of the triangle is going to be this distance here, Q1. And the height of the triangle is the difference between where this demand curve hits the price axis and what the price people actually pay is. So if you go through the math on that, you remember that your formula for the area of a triangle is 1 half base times height. And we plug in some plausible numbers on this. We get something like consumer surplus is $150. On the other side of the market, we have the economic benefit that producers get from participating in the market. And the first thing we need to think about here is what are producers costs or what are their reservation prices as we call it. And the reservation price is the lowest price that a seller is willing and able to accept for a good. And you see this term used in things like auctions where people put something up for auction and they say, well, here's the price though, that's the minimum price. If no one's willing to bid above this, I'm taking my ball and going home. So the net benefit from a transaction or the producer surplus from a sale is the amount the seller actually gets paid minus their costs. And you can see that this is closely related to the idea of profit, that if you get paid $10 for something and it cost you $3 to supply it, then you had a net benefit of $7. In the same way that willingness to pay was the fundamental determinant of the position of the demand curve, willingness seller cost is the fundamental determinant of the position of the supply curve. Namely, for these numbers here with these various different sellers, at a price below $500, no seller can make a profit. So at a price below $500, the quantity supplied is zero. 
once the price reaches $500, we have one willing seller, and then later price rises give us additional willing sellers. And again, the height of the supply curve at each point is equal to the seller cost of the marginal seller. It's equal to the seller cost of the most recent seller to come into the market. And we use that fact to do a similar sort of calculation as we did with consumer surplus. So producer surplus in the market is going to be a different triangle. It's going to be the area below the price, and we're going to subtract off the height of the supply curve because the height of the supply curve is seller costs. So producer surplus is going to have a base of Q1 again and a height of P1 minus the price where the supply curve hits the vertical axis. And if you need to, you can think about flipping this triangle so that it's right side up to get the height. With some plausible numbers here, we would get something like producer surplus is 400 bucks. For now, and we'll come to more complex versions of the gains from trade later, for now the total gains from the existence of this market are just the gains to the two different sides of the market. And this is, you know, often a little bit tricky. Most of us are thinking about ourselves as consumers, and we don't remember that producers actually have some economic welfare, and that counts for something as well.